there's a lot of shock in the world. Uh, if you want to compete, you have to make up your mind to deal with them. That's building inner strength to go through uh, battles. Uh, today's topic is introduction to qualitative research. And we have Dr. Maha Hassan. It's going to put us, go walk us through the process of qualitative research. Then there's this um, saying by Albert Einstein, not everything that counts can be counted. Um, I don't know if I'm saying it right. Not everything that can be counted counts. Let's start from that perspective. Not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that counts can be counted seems to fall in line more with qualitative research. Dr. Maha, tell us, <laughs> what is qualitative research? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Maha Hassan. I'm a medical doctor and a researcher. Um, I work for the University of Toronto. I'm currently working at MAPS Center for Urban Health Solutions. Um, uh, we will be talking about qualitative research today, which is a very important part of research. I think we're more focused, as medical doctors, we're more focused on quantitative research, but I think that paradigm is now changing, the shift is happening. Um, we have been seeing that in um, social determinants of health for a while now, but I think now even the quantitative researchers know that this is one field that you cannot really neglect. Um, we will be talking about these. Let me share my screen so we can start the presentation. And thank you so much for that inspiring video. I can't wait for the second half at the end. <laughs> okay, let's talk about qualitative research. Can you see my screen? Absolutely, go ahead. Perfect, okay. So the learning objectives today is we will talk about, give an introduction to healthcare research, define the qualitative research, the types of qualitative research and sampling methods, compare the qualitative and quantitative research and analyzing qualitative data. Now, before I start this presentation, I just want you to know that the purpose is just to introduce you to qualitative research and let you know how important it is. Um, it, you will see a lot of details here that you might not understand. And it's okay, because it, it might be the first time that some of you would be seeing those terms. I'm here to explain them to you. But again, the takeaway point is for you to understand how important this part of research is. So let's begin. Healthcare research. Now there are three main types of, um, basically three divisions of research. There's the quantitative data that we all know um, is the research method that uses data, um, that is measures of values and counts that are then you described using statistical analysis methods that help the researcher make um, inferences or get results from. The qualitative research on the other hand is a research method that uses interviews um, to get to human experiences. Um, it's a very broad um, kind of research, it's exploratory, um, and we'll talk about it in just a bit. And then there's the mixed methods approach that uses a combination of the two quantitative and qualitative research. The qualitative research is basically research about human experiences and realities. It examines the how and why of decision-making rather than when, what, and where. Like I said, it's very broadly stated, it's open-ended. The analysis is concurrent with and post data collection. Basically, you're getting into deep waters without really knowing what's there already. You, you're exploring okay. an entire place. Okay. Thank you. This is just a brief description of quantitative and qualitative research. Quantitative research is where you have assumes there's a single reality. When we start our research project, we have a question in our mind. We already have that question. And we are either we're looking for evidence that either supports that question. So we know either that question is true or false. That's our basic purpose of that research. Qualitative, on the other hand, like I said, you're going into deep waters and you don't know how deep the waters are. You're going to explore. So this assumes the existence of dynamic and multiple realities. The data collection methods, quantitative is very rigid. Um, you have questionnaires, you have scales, you know what you're doing, what the next step is, you know everything. Qualitative, you have the steps in front of you, but this is semi-structured, it's interviews, it's observation. You don't know what you're gonna find, basically. You have an idea in your head because you do some background research, but you're exploring. The design for quantitative research, like I said, it's very rigid and it's predetermined. 
of course, there's room to wiggle if you get stuck somewhere, but generally you do everything. The protocol is set before you start the project. Qualitative research, on the other hand, you have a protocol, but it's very flexible and it can change. The sample size for quantitative research, we always have a sample size calculation before. We're gonna have 500 people for this study. We're gonna have a thousand people for this study. That's the number of subjects we need. Qualitative research, on the other hand, you collect data till you get data saturation. You can get data saturation with, let's say, 15 people that you speak with about their experiences, or you can get data saturation with 50 people or 100 people. It depends on your project and what area you're researching. Data analysis. For quantitative, it's variable. Um, it's, you involve different statistical methods, um, different calculations are involved. The qualitative research, on the other hand, is non-statistical, mostly descriptive, we do coding, and I'll be talking about that in just a bit, so I'll, I won't discuss this in depth here. The types of qualitative research um, that are most commonly used in medical education. Again, um, remember the purpose of this is just to introduce you to these. You would not probably, at the end of this presentation, I don't expect everyone to remember these three terms even. I know a case study, everyone would be like, oh yes, that I remember and that's important. Ethnographic grounded theory. We're just talking about it just to give you a flavor of what qualitative research is. It's not just case study, that's what I'm getting at. So. Let's start with the ethnographic research. This basically um, looks at the health behaviors of a culture sharing group, that is group of people who share similar meanings, customs, or experiences. An example of that is, for example, um, this author was trying to explore the barriers to opioid availability and cancer pain management in India. Now, this is a very broad um, term again, I mean, if you look at his paper, because India is like a very big country, and then there's like different groups of people there. But still, compared to the world, he picked up one country, and he interviewed 59 participants using in-depth semi-structured interviews. Um, he got observation, and at the end of that, he was able to um, infer that he was able to infer barriers by open coding and thematic analysis of the formal interviews. He, he was able to list down some of the barriers that that country, the people living there would experience. We all have different views on life and a lot of them are influenced by our cultures and customs. So. The other kind of qualitative research is the grounded theory, which is basically where uh, we discover or generate theory in the context of social process being studied. Quotations of participants are also used in a supportive capacity to substantiate the findings. An example of that is a study by Williams where he explored the nature of relationship between the sense of self and eating disorders. He interviewed 11 women who had a history of anorexia nervosa, and he was able to infer there was a relationship between self and anorexia nervosa. And the last example that I chose to talk about is the case study research that we all are very interested in. It focuses on the description and in-depth analysis of the cases or issues illustrated by the cases. The data collection is through observations, one-to-one -one interviews, artifacts, and documents. The analysis is through themes and cross um, case okay. themes that okay. are derived. Um, and just to give you, okay, let's see if I have an example. I do have an example here. So the perceptions of post-stroke sexuality in a woman of childbearing age, which was explored through a quali qualitative case study approach where they interviewed a woman, a 36 year old mother of two children with history of acute ischemic stroke. Data was analyzed and they were able to conclude that stroke during childbearing years may affect a woman's perception of herself as a sexual being and her ability to carry out gender roles. Now this example here might seem a little bit complicated because this is more um, I can see a lot of social determinants of health being spoken about here in this example. Simple examples of case studies. I mean, we just had our pandemic um, and there were so many cases at the beginning, whenever someone had COVID, you would see a case study being published. And now even at the hospitals, whenever there's like a, a rare, not a rare, but one, one of like slightly rare conditions or not so common cases when you see those and those are published, that is an example of case study. Um, 
So that is just to differentiate because I know when you read this example, you're like, oh, what, what's going on here? Like this is one woman they're interviewing, but this four stroke sexuality in a woman of childbearing age. Yes. So there's a lot going on here. But to simplify, you can just think about a simple COVID case, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic and how they described everything. That's a case study that's also qualitative research. Sampling. Now, sample size. So how do we recruit people? Now, this was a good quote where they say that participants are not recruited on a representative basis, but rather because of their expert knowledge of the phenomenon under inquiry. This is extremely important for qualitative research, because here you're not looking for representation as your first screening. If I might, I don't know if I'm making sense here, but right. here the first step would be to get people who have knowledge or who are related to that subject. Right. For example, I, if I talk about my area, my expertise are in social determinants of health. I do a lot of research on very sensitive subjects such as HIV screening um, in the most marginalized and stigmatized populations, sex workers, health issues related to them, uh, and then domestic violence. All three of these are very sensitive because people don't wanna talk about it as often. And so recruiting people is a challenge itself. But when I go to recruit people for this in my qualitative study, I'm not going to see, oh, okay, let me get this person because they belong to this group. Let me get this person. No, my first screening would be someone who is, for example, who has been diagnosed with HIV or has a risk factors for HIV. And after that screener, would I then look for other, for example, the demographics, then I would focus on that. But my first screening would be the condition. Do they have the condition or not? Types of sampling. So Mm -hmm. Sorry, so from what I understand what you from what I understand from what you said so far in the sampling, I know I was supposed to interject, but I was just uh, attending to things behind the scene. Um, so you're what you're trying to say that in qualitative research, your sampling technique is targeted at the sample that is suited best to answer your research question, mm -hmm. something like that. Yes, right. yes. So the 10 people who I will interview for my research will all be related. They need to have that condition. Or if I'm, for example, interviewing medical doctors, they right. need to have their expertise in that area. I will not go and interview a random XYZ doctor. I need to recruit participants with the expertise in that right. area. Right. So the types of sampling, let's talk about that. The selection depends on the nature and needs of the study. There are different types of sampling methods. There's convenience sampling, there's a purpose of sampling, and then there's a snowball sampling. Convenience sampling is accidental sampling, where you basically just collect data from researchers who are selected based on accessibility, geography, proximity. This accompanies the issues of sample representation. So this is where you're just getting people like, you know, you just want to, this is convenient sampling. You might not necessarily be recruiting people related to that expertise. And this comes with its challenges. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. The more suited types of sampling are the purpose of sampling and the snowball sampling. Purposive is where you identify population based on the already established sampling criteria, and then you select subjects who fulfill that criteria to increase the credibility. These are the two types of sampling methods that I have used, and not just me, but other researchers use at my research center at the University of Toronto. The purpose of sampling, which I just spoke about, and then the snowball sampling. Snowball sampling is the chain referral sampling. When you are doing a research on extremely stigmatized population or hard to reach groups, it's important to get your networks involved. You cannot just go and find people. I can't just go for a stroll outside and find people on the road. No, it's hard. These stigmatized populations are hard to reach. An example of this, like I mentioned, people experiencing domestic violence, they do not, they would come to an office visit and they would never admit that they're experiencing domestic violence. Most of them don't. Um, so you have to go to the domestic group violence agencies. You have to go, you have to connect with them. Um, similarly for HIV, different, different groups. Basically the stigmatized populations, the hard to reach populations, you have to um, reach out to your networks. 
the sampling starts by having a few initial participants and the researcher relies on these early participants to help identify additional study participants. An example of that is one of my studies on the sex workers. Uh, you approach some and then they will help you connect with other sex workers because no one's going to come to me and be like, oh yeah, I'm interested in this study because this is my profession. No, they will not disclose that information. So you have to get your networks involved. You make contacts and then based on those contacts, you get other participants. And this is best to reach stigmatized groups. Sample before size. You, yeah, before you jump onto sample size, let's go back a little bit to your sample sampling techniques. Yeah, the first one mm -hmm. and the second one. Uh, the second mm -hmm. one, the most important, the combination sampling, first and second one. So that reminds me of um, some just to put it to put put it into context. Um, for example, if I want to measure since we're trying, we're saying that qualitative research is measuring a number of things, processes, um, perspectives, values, um, um, concepts, you're not actually measuring like numbers, like mean, median, and mode, you're trying to understand processes. So if I want to do uh, uh, physicians or surgeons perspective, for example, let's say I want to measure, I want to write on surgeons perspective on the use of um, the use of open, like open, open surgery versus robotic surgery, for example, I want to measure, I want to measure what surgeons 60 years and above think or I want to write a paper on, is that, does that fit into, does that fit into qualitative um, research? And if I want to do my purposive sampling, I'll just go into my hospital, look at surgeons, the least that are 65 years and above, and then target them as my focus group, correct? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Right, and then, then go ahead and then get some like in, use an interview style or motivational interview style of um, administering my my test article to listen to them, hear them talk, their perspective, or send them an email and hear from them, and then I use I collect the data eventually to make up my quantitative research quantitative research correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. that is correct. Right. That's exactly okay. what this is. Yes. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Data collection. So this is based, there are different um, techniques that you can use. There's observation, there's interviews, there's focus groups, there's open ended prompts, there's artifacts, documents, and photos. Um, observation here basically means the field notes that you take. Um, you go in and you see what's happening and then you take notes. So this would apply for, for example, the research that you mentioned, what you, um, the idea that you shared, you will have interviews or focus groups, depending on how big it is and what your study, what your style is, what, how you want to do the research, but you might be taking some field notes, for example, like, you know, what the surgeon was doing. If there's anything that stands out that you think is related to your research, you might put down in your notes that's observation. You're just observing their behavior while they're talking to you. The interview can be one-on-one -on -one interview, in-depth interview, focus groups. Focus groups are basically a discussion um, where you have four or five people or even more sitting around a table and you basically discuss with them. So you're asking questions that brings up some discussion points and you're discussing with them and you record it. Um, you have open-ended prompts. You use open-ended, you never use closed-ended prompts. You let them decide what they want to say. You never put words in their mouths. That is the rule for qualitative research. And then artifacts, of course, if there are any documents, any photos that you think might support your, for example, case studies, we use documents, we use photos. Um, whatever can support your research, you collect that. Dr. Maha, before mm -hmm. you proceed, there's a, there's a question. Um, in the chat, maybe we'll touch on it um, because it might open up other components of things that you want to discuss. Dr. Toro um, <coughs> sent in this question. Excuse me. I'll let you. Excuse me. Um, great presentation so far. Thank you so much, Hassan. So, is focus group interview considered? Dr. Toro, if you want to speak up, you can speak up, Dr. Ma, because we're trying to make it as interactive as possible. 
so that would uh, go away from the normal, from the, let me use the word, boring slide presentation that makes everybody not want to, you know, pass out. So Dr. Tori, you can unmute your mic and ask your question yourself if you, if you want to. All right, so perhaps Dr. Tori. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Thank you so much, Dr. Azan, for the presentation. Um, it's been great and very informative so far. So um, I've been in a group like, you know... Well, I'm trying to add it to... I'm trying to put it to... I'm, I'm trying to add it to... Dr. Maha, you can stop sharing. Let's see her face. I'm oh, trying to add okay, that to the... Um... Oh, no. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but I'm not... Oh. I mean, I'm not kind of like ready for video. All today. right, all right, all right, go ahead. <laughs> so um, I've been part of a group where, you know, focus group interviews was um, used to, you know, as the, as the study style for that, um, for that study, but it wasn't in medicine. It was kind of like a different, um, I can't remember what topic, it was a while ago, and at the time I wasn't really like involved in the study per se, I was just one of the participants. So my question is that how common is focus group interviews used in clinical medicine? Um, and could you give like examples of scenarios where we could use it or where it could be preferable over say quantitative uh, research. Let so me let me, let me let me let me uh, do a forerunner for Dr. Maha. Dr. Toro, a, a typical example of a lot there are a lot of focus groups. Let's use alcoholics, for example, alcohol and animals. And if you, you can attend their meeting, follow okay. their process, that's a typical focus group that is very readily available for all of us in this group to get papers from. Okay. And then you can want to find out their lived experience. Um, recovery from alcohol addiction mm, okay as simple as that so you just want to listen to like 10 people talk about their real lived experience not this textbook or give them naloxone give all this all this kind of craving blockers and mm -hmm. all this textbook stuff. you just want to listen to them talk about their everyday experience recovering or their why they relapse that could be a typical qualitative research, and you okay. want to hear from 10 or 20, because remember that what she, what she said, in the sample size mustn't be like a quantitative research. It could just be two people's experience okay. on their recovery process or on their relapse process, how many times they relapsed, why they relapsed, okay. and what pushed them to relapse. And you make up your paper, and that is a beautiful, beautiful paper that people want to hear. Okay. It could come in as anonymous. It depends on if you follow the normal process, the IRB approval, and they have a process of getting information from them. So an alcohol anonymous is almost everywhere around mm -hmm. us. And you can attend their meeting and then just tell them you want to do A, B, C, follow their process, get an approval, just listen to them. That's okay. a very beautiful focus group. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, I'm doing an addiction medicine. I'm in addiction medicine currently, and okay. there are a lot of people that are hooked to cigarettes. It's something that people don't want to talk about, a very critical component of addiction. A lot of people are hooked to pornography. A lot of people are hooked to um, their phone. For example, in our group, for example, our IMG group, <laughs> you, could, you could do a qualitative research on why are you hooked on your phone? You're just trying to understand why a medical doctor who's busy seeing patients is always reaching to touch his phone. <laughs> and that could be your focus group. Doctors that are hooked to the phone. I don't know if I, that was a forward or Dr. Maha, you can add one or two contents to that. We'll go mm -hmm. from there. Thank you, yeah, Dr. No, these, are, these are very good examples. Um, and that's exactly how we do focus groups. Um, mm -hmm. One of the projects I worked on was where we had one-on-one -on -one interviews with the female participants, but then the uh, domestic violence service providers, we mm -hmm. had them as a focus group because it was hard for them. Like, you know, instead of doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, we got them all together um, mm -hmm. to get their input during COVID, how violence had escalated. So just to get their input on that, we got them all together, um, mm -hmm. got asked them about different strategies that they recommend. Um, mm -hmm. 
so I think all the different, that's the beauty of this, that you can be so open. Like there's no rigid method that, no, you just have to do this. You can do it the way you want, the way you feel comfortable and the mm -hmm. way make, that makes sense to you in your head, that you think you'd be able to get better data if you do one-on-one -on -one interview versus focus groups. Okay. These are just different ways. Exactly. So, yeah. And I, I usually, I usually, I usually um, just as a um, finisher, I usually say, Qualitative research for a research for a beginner is almost the easiest because it's like narrative. Yes, it's it's just like narrative, and in what your your focus group could just be, your sample size could just be one single person. Mm -hmm. As long as you declare it in your methodology, you're trying to interview four residents on their perspective on the use of interpreter services, for example, in the hospital where you work. Okay. Um, ER physicians on how on their on it could be nutrition, food, um, okay. perspective, uh, patients' perspective on the quality of food that is served in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> you know, patients you know, have so much can to generate, say right? <laughs> We can generate as much topics in every little thing in qualitative research, but in mm -hmm. IMG Research Academy, we're trying to generate topics that's also going to improve patient outcome. So yeah. that is my yes. goal. If I'm looking to talk to alcohol and uh, anonymous food, I want to think of what am I going to, what topic do I discuss with them mm -hmm. that's going to help another person really needs not to relapse. Yeah. So maybe finance, maybe marital discord, yeah. to relapse, maybe the craving, you went, they did not see doctors that gave them the medications that would stop the craving, access problem, access to insurance, you know, mm -hmm. the whole lot of things. And then I limit myself to the most narrow topic, not broad, the most narrow thing that I can talk about, write my 3,000 words interview mm -hmm. series. Okay. That's it. Okay. So then I take it that um, a you know, focus group interview study could be a precedent for, you know, like we could extract data from that study or from that paper and then use it for a quantitative study in the future as well. Is that is that something possible? Absolutely. Now, if you want to use it as quantitative study, then it has to have measurable data. So you're not talking about reporting a mixed study kind type of paper. Right okay. in, in this presentation, Dr. Mahar, don't uh, I hope I'm not running after running before you. Uh, it's qualitative, pure qualitative research. We're not putting in any data. We're just talking about perspective, processes, attitude, okay. uh, knowledge. You know, we're measuring all these things. That I, Albert Einstein says many things that matter cannot be quantified. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's what we're trying to like measure. Those things that cannot be quantified in the science world. That's yeah. what we're trying to measure and report. Dr. Maha, continue from where you All start. right, sounds good. Thank you both so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, let's let me share my screen. Okay, there we go. So we were talking about data collection, observation. Yeah. Um what does that mean? Observation is basically when you spend time with a group of people as they carry out their daily activities. This is what I said, like, for example, when you're speaking with people or even when you're doing focus groups, just observe what's going on around you to understand the experiences of the group members, their activities, interactions, to understand how contextual factors influence the activities. It's important to just keep your eyes open, take field notes, any sketches, anything that stands out to you. It's just important to have it because you never know when you're sitting and analyzing the data and all of a sudden you think about something and if you have it written, if you, if you were taking field notes, that would be helpful. The next is interviews. Again, as I mentioned before, there are different types of interviews. They're structured, which is verbal questionnaire. They're scripted questions and you strictly go by them. There's these semi-structured interviews where you have an outline of topic guides, questions, um, and there's a bit of wiggle room. Then there's informal, which is conversational, and questions arise in context. So as you're talking to the other person, they say something, and then you, you think of another question and you ask them. And then there's the retrospective, which focuses on the past events. And again, with all these different types of uh, interviews, there is no better style 
or less better style. It depends on your study, what your study is and what do you think works better? What, can, what will help you gather better data? Focus groups. There are small groups with a moderator. I think the first slide where I have like a small table with four chairs, three or four chairs around, that explains a focus group. We would have like anywhere between four to 10 people on a group and there's a moderator sitting there you're discussing a topic of interest in a short span of time. Um, it's a group interview with insight into interactions um, compared to interviews. Um, and it's important the topic of interest would be easy for participants to discuss in a group. And I think we spoke about this earlier when I gave the example. Now the data analysis. Data analysis is different here. This is not like your quantitative research. Quantitative research is where you have all the metrics in front of you. You have your beautiful spreadsheets and you have to analyze. This is different. You have all the qualitative data in front of you. You did all the interviews. You have all those words in front of you. Now what do you do? The researchers strives to identify small meaning units called codes. So you read the data that you've gathered and then you see are there any words that are coming up again and again that are related to your topic of interest? Those are codes. The codes are then grouped based on their shared concepts to form the primary categories. You're basically trying to get themes that are emerging. So you identify themes that are emerging. If you spoke with 10 people and 10 people said one thing which was common in all the interviews, that's one theme which is common in all the interviews. Then out of that theme, are there any words that strike out? I don't know if you guys know those apps that we use. Um, I'm forgetting the name of that. Um, that you use to describe one thing and like all of a sudden you have these hundred synonyms uh, that come up. Um, we use this in medicine as well and also motivational stuff we have that. But anyway, that's basically what I'm trying to get at is that you find words that are coming up again and again and that, that basically take you towards that theme. Those are codes. And then once you have the themes, once you have the codes, that helps. Um, narrow down that helps guide that basically guides you towards the results section and you have to document every step whatever you're doing the way you identify the codes the themes that you identified you have to document everything for the paper in the last bullet here says in the results section of the manuscript the researcher describes the key findings and themes that emerged from the interviews the tools for coding and data management um, before this technology came up, people used to do manual coding. We still do manual coding if there's not a lot of data. So I have done that for some of my research projects. Not, I wouldn't say some because then eventually we had to use NVivo when the sample size grew. But at the beginning of every project, when you're still testing how it's going to be, how data collection is going to be, you start with a few interviews, two or three interviews, and then you see what it's going to be like, and then you expand. Um, so yeah, when you expand, you use one of these technologies here. I have experience with NVivo, but there are other programs as well that you can use for coding. There are reporting guidelines, just like any kind of research method. Um, we have reporting guidelines for quantitative as well. For meta-analysis, there's a separate checklist. We have checklists for qualitative as well, and these are important because they guide our research methodology. There are different ones mentioned here. There's the COREC, which is 32 item checklist. There's a critical appraisal skills program, which is a 10 item checklist. The ethical issues, these are extremely important. You have to protect the identity of the participants. You have to do that. And that doesn't just mean, oh, I'm gonna block out the name of the person. No, you cannot give out anything that would help other people, even in that group, identify that person you have to protect the identity. The researcher must respect individuals, families, and communities, and must make sure that participants are not identifiable by their occupations. You're basically putting communities at risk when you're doing this kind of research, because if you, if you say that this community said something about this community, that can basically put two communities against each other. Whoever's reading that paper, that can basically generate this prejudice, this bias, this risk of all that. So you have to protect, you have to be very mindful of ethical issues that can arise. You have to obtain consent. This is very important. You're audio recording people. You might video record them. You're writing every single word down. You have to get consent before you start recording or noting their words. 
researchers must ensure the confidentiality and the anonymity of the transcripts. You have to tell the participants that this will be completely anonymous and they will not, no one can identify them basically through, um, so they can easily share whatever they want to share with you. And these are just the resources I used for this presentation. And that is it for now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Maha. Thank you so much. That was a brilliant um, summary of uh, introduction. There's a lot more to talk about uh, qualitative research. I just want us to also understand that there are processes, laid down guidelines for this. So we'll be going into details in this series while we are still also doing our research statistics series. So we'll try to see how we can um, blend both of them to move together. Thank you, Dr. Maha. We want to open the uh, mic to people to ask your question. We have about nine minutes to go. If you have any question to ask, you can go ahead and um, open your mic, raise your hand, send it in a chat, um, however you feel convenient or comfortable with. I just want to remind people that even though qualitative research seems to be one of the easy ones, it is not as easy as we are trying to demystify it. And um, the last paragraph that Dr. Maha raised about research process is something we keep echoing in this uh, group. Um, the ethical principles of research, you don't study anybody without a person's uh, consents, you know, beneficence, justice, um, all those whole ethical principles of research. I can't remember all of them. Um, please, please, please make sure that you follow guidelines and um, rules around your institution, around ethical principles of research before you do anything research, um, understand what it is to go through an IRB, understand what it is to get an informed consent, understand what it is for people to withdraw their consent, understand what it is to protect people's rights, uh, especially your subject's rights, uh, understand proper writing techniques. Everything is true, but not everything that is true can be written. It's what we know in research. Um, so questions? Yeah, and just as we're waiting for questions, I'll just quickly touch up on uh, case reports, case studies. They're very easy to put together. Um, like I said, you just need an interesting case from the hospital and follow the skeleton. You have a skeleton, the information that you need. But again, before that, what we were just talking about, consent, you need permission from the patient. Get that permission before you discharge the patient, before he gets out of your hands. Speak with the patient. <laughs> I'm not trying to tell you to lure him into something you're not offering anything, but speak with them that you're interested. Let them know that by doing a case study, they would be helping so many other patients. Um, so get their consent while st they're still there. And then you can publish. Of course, you won't give out their name. You won't give out their demographic. You can give out while well, you can share what their ethnicity is. But, oh, there's a question there. Yeah, we have a question. Dr. Rafael, do you want to speak up or you want us to read your question? I guess you want us to read your question. But if you want to speak up, that would be great. All right. Um, let's read your question since you didn't speak up. Uh, Dr. Rafael Lamidi says, um, is it okay to say that qualitative research is more suitable for red? cases because of the limited amount of sample size required? No, no. So that is not correct. Um, for if you're talking about case studies that we do in medicine, yes, uncommon cases. I wouldn't say rare cases. You might even be talking about, let's say, Stephen Johnson syndrome. I mean, we still see it. It's not extremely rare. We see it's rare. We still see it. But you can publish on that as long as you're bringing in a point which has not been explored before in the other case studies that are published. So it's not extremely rare cases. Um, this is just case study. Qualitative research, on the other hand, the subjects that I spoke about, like the HIV projects that I worked on, the domestic ones, but, and I worked on these for, I've been working on them since 2015. So it's been like so many years. They're like long-term projects that I've been working on. They're not rare. 
they're not rare. But of course, you're trying to bring new stuff to the table. Like we developed a new screening um, tool for intimate partner violence for patients that it can be used in clinic. Um, it's not rare, no. But you definitely do not want to repeat things. You're gonna to try to bring in a new perspective on the same, the issues are gonna be the same, but you're going to try to bring a new perspective on that. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, Dr. Lamidi. We have another question from Dr. John. What happens if a patient says no? Um, <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> in one of the ethical principles of research is respect for autonomy. If somebody says no, you're not gonna proceed with that research. That's the, that's the official answer. Um, you can proceed with the research when someone doesn't give you consent, when the subject doesn't give you consent. So I think, I think that should answer that. No matter how much you want that paper to be written or that concept to be known or how important this, you want to understand why um, X, Y, Z is so important, it's going to protect people's lives, it's going to do this, but the person that you want to interview or the person you want to get the data from doesn't want you to get the data that you should not proceed. That's very basic. Um, Dr. Horumba says, Dr. Horumba, you want to speak up or you want us to read your question? I guess you want us to read your question. I wanted to ask, in a situation where for some reason an ethical principle is breached, how can it be resolved? Have you come across a situation like that and how was it handled? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, when you are working on different projects, you will come across situations where you, you can be as careful as like, you know, it's very good to be extremely diligent with the process. And we are always extremely diligent, of course, but this is why you have the IRB or the ERB, the, um, East, uh, the Research Ethics Board. Um, if something of that sort happens, you have to get in touch with them. Um, this has never happened with me, but with a colleague of mine where an email address was um, mistakenly sent. It was a participant's email address was shared with five other participants, and that was a breach. So, you know, breach occurs at that little level. I mean, who cares about an email address? But I think they were all included on the same email and it should not have been included. You cannot share email addresses. You cannot share names with each other. And to fix that, uh, my colleague then had to reach out to the research ethics board. They guided the next steps. It was fixed after that. But of course we have to be, we should be extremely diligent so it doesn't happen. All right, I see a lot of ethics questions coming up. That gives me an impression that we're going to talk about research ethics in one of our subsequent uh, topics. So important to understand research ethics. Um, Dr. Ihorumba, I hope she answered your, your question, but I think she answered it brilliantly. If uh, ethical principle is breached, you just have to report it. You report it to, so every institution has uh, um, a process of reporting a breach in ethical principle is that how you report it to your ethics committee, you report it to your to your IRB, which is also in some places, same as ethics committee, or you report it to your departmental chair, you report it to your GME chair. So there are a lot of um, lots, there's a process to report in so many institutions. And if you're not on in, in any institution, then you report it to the people that gave you the approval or the necessary people there. Like work, for example, it's an IRB that is central and they could resolve or figure out how to resolve these ethical breaches. Dr. Debola, lots of questions coming in today. Uh, what if the patient have passed away? That's a very interesting question. What I will run before Dr. Maha is just weigh in on that. Um, every institution has a policy on handling data. First of all, the HIPAA data, the HIPAA compliance that we all sign and we have to uh, comply with, and then the research ethical processes. In most cases, if a patient has died, you have to write to the IRB through the institutional approval system because every institution has their approval system. They will tell you, let's say, for, let me give a typical example. I want to write on Mr. XZ, who has cardiomyopathy, very interesting case when he's passed, on, passed away. So I cannot obtain informed consent from him. What do I do next? 
two things, two rounds to go. One, he has a nest of kin who can also, because he is officially designated as nest of kin, can give you consent to proceed with compiling data. That's number one. Number two, you can write through your institutional head, for example, your head of department, your departmental chair, your, your director, or whoever is in charge of your departments or your program director, and you want to report Mr. XZ. And then you submit an application to the IRB to give you a waiver. You can also get waivers, waivers of consent when you cannot get informed consent from, a non, let's say you're doing a case series of like 50 people that have dispersed. So then it's practically impossible to get this, these um, informed consent from these 50 people. Your IRB can give you a waiver. And they give this waiver based on the risk benefit ratio of what you are applying. So when they look at your application, they're gonna ask what is the objective of your research? What is the risk benefit ratio? Does it, does it benefit outweigh the risks of getting this information? And, but before then, remember there's also the HIPAA law that's operational. So you have to go through your HIPAA process to be sure that you're not exposing patients identity or the patient identifiers. So that's what usually happens when a patient dies. Some other institutions give you blank, blank, blanket um, approval to write case reports without going through an IRB. So it differs. Find out what, uh, what works in your institution and then follow their process. Um, Dr. Chugo, is a consent a document, hard copy, or can it be word of mouth? Dr. Maha. So when, if it's a patient, you would approach them, you would tell them about it, but you need their signatures. It will be a hard copy. They have to provide consent and you have to document. You need to have a hard copy for your record. And then you will be submitting that to the research ethics board as well. Always, always, always. This is a rule in research. Um, always have everything in, like if you're getting consent, hard copy. Because you never know. I mean, what if someone has a change of heart? You always need to have, document everything. So. So there's this, there's this story I want, I usually say, uh, tell about documenting consenting processes. Um, we are physicians and very soon become the bull's eye, if you know what it means to be the bull's eye. So you become a target in the society. Every little thing you do, gonna attract lawsuits, gonna attract uh, uh, journalists and what so not and what so not, right? So you always wanna do what they, what they call CYA, um, I don't want to mention it here, but it may just cover your ass. Like you have to defend and do everything possible to protect yourself. I'll give you an example. What if you um, got a verbal consent from a patient to write about his case? Very rare case, a case of two heads. So a woman gave birth to two heads, for example, or, or whatever, three lips or, fit, or 10 lips. Very, very rare case. And everybody's excited. She's excited. Yeah, we explain to the patient, hey, I like the medical community to see know about this case. We want to write it in general American Medical Association, blah, blah, blah. And you go ahead and you write it. 10 years down the line, she wakes up someday and says, no, I didn't give that doctor approval to talk about me. And then they sue you 20 years or 30 years after. And you'd be like, wow, wait, you gave me approval. And she said, no, I don't know you. You wrote about my baby. Now that caused uh, uh, social stigma on my baby. Now everybody's after my baby because of an article you wrote 40 years ago and they sue you for like $10 million or whatever. So always, 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 always document, document, consent obtained. Most institutions have official consent forms that you're gonna use to, ask, to obtain consent. And the process of obtaining consent is very, pretty much easy. We're gonna go, we're gonna discuss ethics of research in one of our topics. And it's gonna be interesting. Probably we're gonna bring Dr. Maha or one of these ethicists that's gonna talk about all the principles of research in real life scenario we're gonna take. Thank you, Dr. Maha. I don't see any other question. We're on top of the hour, 8.04. I want to be respectful of other people's time. I'm going to end this scientific session now by stopping the um, recording. You want to